I believe in living what is in the heart and finding what is in the heart and serving the heart. The heart is the divine mind, not the brain. Mm. So if I wanted that for myself, which I do, and I want that for my children, I had to want that for my husband, even though times were hard. I couldn't say, well, I'm finding my divine voice and you go clock in at the law firm and make everything fine. So somehow I knew because I had this extreme faith, I had this knowing and this awareness that the way through these challenges was to really find out what was the truth of each of our hearts and to do everything that we could to fulfill that. And that some way, by some grace, by some miracle or some divine intervention, that somehow our lives would be ordered in a way that it would support that expression. Was there ever a moment where you thought it was too much and you were like, this is not working and I'm ready to give up? There was one moment and it was when we had almost come through, we were coming through and it was when you DNF'd at Ultraman and you relapsed. Mm -hmm. And in the wake of that, after having held space for you for so many years, I mean, through such adversity and such friction and tension, it was hard for me to imagine that you would make that choice because I'm not an addict and I wasn't in that frame. But at that moment, I I had a moment where I was like, have I misjudged who Rich is? Have I misjudged him because we're just arriving out of this battle and we're actually being realized and this is the choice he made in that moment. Yeah, that was a a, a low moment. That was a rough that was a rough experience to to navigate through. I mean the level of like shame and sense of disappointment that I had that I'd let myself down and you down and this whole plan down was very difficult. But in retrospect now having, you know, many years passed since then, like, how do you look back on that experience? Um, It was, you know, it was still a hard moment. I mean, it was a, it was a moment of, you know, are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) (laughs) Quite frankly, you know, Um, it was, uh, you know, super difficult. I mean, again, I've said it before, I was grateful for your uh, community in AA and all the guys that you have around you, so many beautiful men that are in your life as a part of that program. And, you know, they were right there and, you know, Tyler was there and, you know, you got, you know, you got righted like right away. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a long, it wasn't a long uh, spell in that. Mm -hmm. But I do remember arriving back from Hawaii and I had supported you in your expression through all of these years. And I was, I gave birth to Jaya and was really sort of in this seclusion at home with the kids and doing ceremony and and spiritual practices and ritual and holding this vision for us, and then started creating the food and the recipes. And I had um, written two albums and and become musician along with Tyler and Trapper, our oldest sons. And so I was finally at the moment where I was going to get to record my album. And it had been years, it was seven years of, of working, workshopping these songs. And so right after that moment, when we arrived back home, that was my turn. That mm-hmm. was when Brad was coming here with his recording gear. We were setting up a studio in the house. I had him booked for 10 days to two weeks, and we were recording my first album. So part of me, what I did is I took my anger and put it to the side because I wasn't going to let that ruin my experience of music So I sort of just was like, okay, I don't like this, and this has really upset me, and Rich is fine now, and he's working it out, and so I'm going to put this to the side for the moment, and I'm going to focus on this creative expression. And then what happened is the boy's dad died suddenly and tragically on day three of my recording session. So what I endured at the end of that year, 2011, was pretty staggering. I mean, a pretty, pretty intense um, sort of energetic experience that I had to traverse through after having held that vision for us for so long. And even though I hadn't been with the boy's dad for 14 years, he was very close in their lives and very close to me. And I had to process that grief through myself. 
So it was still many, many months and many, many things before my music came to fruition. And by that time, I guess we had just worked it all out, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But I suspect it made you a stronger person to have to endure all of that and navigate the difficulties of, uh, the complex difficulties of loss, anger, creative output, parenting, and just the general responsibilities of having to, you know, get through the day. I mean, even though, yes, we were emerging from our financial difficulties, we were by no means out of the woods at that point. I mean, there was still quite a ways to go and we would dip deeper before we kind of really emerged out of it. It's true. It's true. I mean, what I would say from my perspective of that, I would say that it was a full experience of life that I that I experienced, and that experience was full of heartbreak, loss, uh, tragedy, triumph, creative connection. And the weirdest thing was during the days following the death of the boy's father, Lou, um, I felt a simultaneous experience of grief and birth. And it's not something that I've ever spoken about before. I probably never told you about this before, but it was a very profound dichotomy of this juxtaposition of two extremes that are maybe the same thing. And so it was an extremely profound, potent a really deep experience. His exit from this world was one of the most profound experiences that I've had. And it's because there were all these synchronicities and signs that were in the music, uh, in people that I met, um, just coincidences and, and, and things that happened during that time. And I really did feel the presence of divinity in that space. I felt that it was it was met. I remember when you were racing and Ultraman Lou was texting me and he was checking you, he was following the race. And that was kind of a first Mm -hmm. because it's not like we were just, you know, we were really good getting divorced and really took care of the children, but it's not like we were hanging out all the time. No, I mean, Lou wasn't, Lou was great, but he wasn't like my buddy. No, we weren't friends, but he was, you know, kind and respectful. And we, you know, we we all handled it like grownups, you know, but it's not like we were taking vacations together or something like that. So he was following your race in those last days. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was texting me and really excited and and all of that. And so um, I think that, uh, that it was just... I forgot my train of thought, what I was just saying. But anyway, it was a... It was the a, divinity in the experience. Yeah, it was very, very divine. I mean, there were other things that happened, like um, uh, uh, Lou's first cousin, Mina. Uh, I was very close with her when I was married to him, and I hadn't talked to her in, like, we hadn't been together for 14 years. I hadn't talked to her for 14 years. So when he passed, we were in contact, and she couldn't attend the memorial service that I facilitated, that I officiated here in our home. You know, I told the boys, now it's a healing project. That's basically what it is. It's a healing mission. And we had everyone come in, you know, from his life, past business um, associates, past lovers, wives, girlfriends, you know, everyone was here. (laughs) All of his lovely cousins, the Pyatt family, you know, an amazing group of individuals. And I officiated that, that process for all of us. And it was really, really beautiful. Uh, Mina couldn't come because she had been given, uh, she had bought a trip for her girlfriend and they were going to Kauai Mm -hmm. and everything had already been booked and bought and everything else. So uh, at that time, Saul Ray, who's a, you know, well-known, renowned yoga teacher that, you know, I grew up in yoga with, and he's been a great ally and a great friend to me and to us. Um, He, you know, emailed or texted me and he was like, Srimati, like, could you come and cook for my retreat? And he said, he knows that I have a special connection to Secret Beach on Kauai. He said, it's near Secret Beach. I don't know if I'm asking too much, but I think it would be good and I could pay you. We needed money. Mm -hmm. So I asked the boys and they said, go ahead and go, mom. So I went there and I remember cooking completely in grief. And Saul would say, what's on the menu? And I would say, I have no idea, but something will be there. And I literally couldn't even make a menu list because I was in such grief. So Mina contacts me. She's on Kauai at the same time. I haven't seen her in 14 years. 
And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the island. Meet me at the Hindu temple at morning puja. So I'm sitting in the temple and she slides up right next to me and we sit together for puja. And we took those flowers from the offering from the priest that day and we went down to Secret Beach and we walked and we reminisced about Lou and we offered these flowers into the ocean. So there were many, many profound things that happened during this time, also connected to my music. Um, Tyler and I were recording In the Sun, which is a song that I wrote about you. And I wrote about the pressure of life and the financial constriction and how hard it is in this world, you know, especially for men to to earn enough and, and be enough and succeed. And the chorus of this song was, fly, daddy, fly, fly, daddy, fly. And I had written that chorus on a previous return from the island of Kauai, from doing spiritual practice. And I had asked for the chorus, and that's what was given. Mm. So years later, uh, after the boys and I workshopped this song over seven years in many different forms, um, Tyler and I even had sung it on the big island during that trip. When you DNF'd, we walked up to the local um, music store and we played it and sang it in the store. And when we finished, we looked up and the shop owner had broken down sobbing in tears. And she said, I'm so sorry. Like you just, it touched me. It touched me. We walked out and Tyler looked at me and he was like, okay, that was good. Like as a musician, right. if you can make somebody cry with your song, like mm -hmm. that's a good sign. So here we were, the boys had said, you know, mom, we know you wrote that song about Rich, but we also think it's about Lou. And it is, it's about every man. And so we would find out later that um, when Lou called 911, he had a heart attack on a kayak. When he called 911, Tyler and I were actually recording that exact song. Mm. So the actual recording on the album Mother of Mine is the exact track at the moment that Lou left his body, that he left this world and moved to another realm. And what was shown to me during that time, when I met Lou, I was in a, an abusive marriage and I was a battered woman. I was on the out of it. I was coming out of it, but that's the truth. That's the ugly truth. And Lou rescued me. He truly was a rescuer. That was his archetype. And that, and he was a fix-it man. He was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to fix your life for you, you know? And he really did. My creative trajectory when I was married to him was like a rocket. I mean, I became an artist, a fashion designer, started my own collection. This was all from being in a relationship where I couldn't even take a step without second-guessing myself. And uh, what I was shown through this experience, what I felt is that Lou had rescued me in this world and I had rescued him into the other world because I knew the spiritual essence and the practices and the rituals and the awareness to actually get him out of his body and get him into the other realm. And the boys were sequestered here safely at our sacred home at Jai House. We were recording music. Like it was, it just felt like it was all sort of divinely planned. And, um, you know, I haven't spoken about it very much because it's a very, very private and very dear thing, but um, it was a profound experience. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. I remember I was out running on the trails when my phone rang. Mm -hmm. You said, you have to come home right now. And you mm -hmm. told me what, what had happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, I'll, I'm going to try to say it without, without crying, but um, to, let's see, it was a horrifying experience to wake your children up to tell them that story, you know? And I remember we had a Ganesh, and I told Mathis ahead of time, and Mathis was much younger, yeah, like she five, was six. five or six, right? Something just, like that. Just turned six, I think. Yeah. So she was like, mom, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And I, and I told her, I said, I have to wake the boys up and I have to tell them that their dad is gone. And I remember I woke them up and we, we gathered around the Ganesh and I wrapped them in the ponchos that we got on our retreats in Mexico. And 
you know, I told them and, and hours afterwards, I went upstairs to take a bath. And I remember Mathis coming in, little baby. And she said to me, mama, she said, you did the very best you could. You did such a good job. You did the very best that you could. And that was just a, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful moment of this experience with our children and how, how amazing they are and how, how powerful they are and how wise they are and what they offer us, you know, in Mm -hmm. those moments. 